Coming up, a Seneca artist is honored for his community work and an update on imprisoned activist Leonard Peltier. Plus, a historical novel looks at the Oklahoma oil boom and the road to healing. I'm Mackenzie Allen Charmley. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Chenangale, we're so happy you could join us. We start in Massachusetts, where one of the largest academic institutions in the country has completed the repatriation of a local tribe's ancestor remains. Harvard University has completed the legal process for the repatriation of 313 Wampanoag remains from communities in Mashpee and Akina. This comes after ProPublica released the repatriation project earlier this month, documenting that Harvard still holds thousands of Native American remains. Bound to federal law of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, many museums and institutions took their first steps in 1990 when the federal law was established, but few have made minimal progress since. Wampanoag citizen Jim Peters, director of the Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs, has worked with Harvard for the past couple of years to complete Wampanoag repatriation efforts. According to Peters, finding a final resting place to rebury the returned ancestor remains is the next step for Wampanoag tribal communities. Following Harvard's lead, the Worcester Historical Museum and Berkshire Museum, also in Massachusetts, will begin their repatriation process for the remains they hold later this year. After two decades, an indigenous entrepreneur in Canada is now the proud owners of two airlines. Matisse citizen Tira Fraser says she's now focused on inspiring indigenous youth to learn to fly. APTN's Tina House has the story. Tira Fraser has been flying for the last two decades, and she is the first Indigenous woman to own her own airline in Canada. She is Métis and was born in Hay River, Northwest Territories. We've just launched Ellibird Aero, which is an aerotech company. So what is an aerotech company? Uh, all things innovation in aerospace and aviation. With the launch of Ellibird Aero, Fraser has just ordered two electric motorized training aircrafts, making her company the first in Canada to have zero emission aircrafts for training units. Ali Aero is Fraser's second airline company, having launched Esquayo Air in 2018. It offers passenger and commercial service from Vancouver's South Terminal to Qualcomm Beach on Vancouver Island. Esquayo means woman in Cree and pays homage to her ancestry. With with Escoyo Air, we see ourselves as that bridge between traditional air transportation and the sustainable technology of the future. So with Escoyo Air, we're already looking at advanced air mobility, um, all, all the ways that we can move towards zero uh, emissions. And we started doing so much of that exciting work that it deserved its own home and its own company so that we can do uh, lots more to innovate in our industry. Along with owning two airline companies, Tira believes in giving back and inspiring the next generation of future pilots with her program called Give Them Wings. It allows Indigenous youth to utilize a flight simulator and get up in the sky and see what flying is all about. So this is all about flight training. So this is about helping folks discover the wonder of flight, the awe of flight, and uh, learning how to fly. You should come. Learn how to fly. 
there's so many people. How many people have you heard say, I've always wanted to learn how to fly? And so we want to help them learn how to fly. There's nothing more inspiring than, than seeing uh, a tree uh, from the sky and seeing the, the world. Flying is pretty cool. Tina House, APTN National News, Delta. Inclusive and native-driven artistic projects are receiving grants from the National Endowment for the Arts. The grants are part of the NEA's announcement to fund arts and humanities projects across the United States. Funding is awarded in four categories and is specifically for underserved communities. Those categories include research awards, literature fellowships, grants for art projects, and Challenge America. NEA Chair Maria Rosario Jackson says these grants show the agency's commitment to strengthening arts and cultural ecosystems. Some of the organizations include the Juno Arts and Humanities Council and the Indigenous Performance Productions. The money will support Indigenous art performances with artist-led ceramic workshops and storytelling projects focused on Native women. In total, more than 30 projects and organizations will receive part of the $34 million in funding. And now in sports news, the National Lacrosse League is kicking off another initiative to increase awareness of Native boarding schools and their history. The Las Vegas Desert Dogs commence their second annual Every Child Matters campaign. The goal of the campaign is to highlight the indigenous children who were forced to attend native boarding schools in the U.S. and Canada. The Desert Dogs will join preseason tournaments in Aquasasne territory near Ontario, Quebec, and New York State. These games are part of efforts to reach the indigenous youth and get them active in the sport. The Desert Dogs will also host an Indigenous Heritage Night on February 4th at the Michelob Ultra Arena in Las Vegas. Tribal citizens will receive free tickets as well as transportation to and from the tournament. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. A Seneca artist is the recipient of the 2023 Johnson Fellowship for Artists Transforming Communities. Americans for the Arts awarded this grant to G. Peter Jemison. He has been a leading voice in successfully advocating for Native rights around issues of repatriation of sacred objects, cultural patrimony, and the human remains of the Haudenosaunee. I interviewed him earlier this week. Take a look. So to start, could you just tell us about this fellowship and what it means to you? Well, it means to me that they are recognizing the work that I've been doing uh, for many decades, actually, uh, attempting to uh, make visible contemporary Native American art and uh, to also work with museums, as you mentioned, to repatriate our ancestors and also the um, funerary objects, uh, cultural patrimony, which uh, includes our wampum belts, back to our nations. Uh, so that they become, again, a part of our way of life or that they are put back in the ground where they should have been kept. Um, so uh, it's kind of just a, a recognition that the work I've been doing uh, hasn't gone unnoticed and uh, they're acknowledging that at this time. You are the site manager of the historic 17th century Ganandigan State Historic Site. Could you tell us about its significance? Uh, sure. Well, Ganondagan is the site of a 17th century Seneca town. We refer to ourselves as Onondawaga, the people of the Great Hill. In English, they call us Seneca. And this was one of our four major towns. It was probably the capital of the Seneca nation between the period of about 1655 and 1687. And in 1987, it was opened as the only New York State historic site acknowledging our uh, native traditions in the state of New York. And I operated it uh, for 34 years. And um, over that course, we built a Seneca Bark Longhouse. We developed guided trails. We introduced native grasses back into the landscape. We started an Iroquois white corn project to preserve our traditional heirloom seed and also to create food from that that's available to our people as well as to other people. 
and then finally in 2015, we opened the Seneca Art and Culture Center, a uh, building that includes a gallery space. It includes an auditorium. It includes archival and classroom spaces. And uh, it really tells our story uh, in a visual way uh, through exhibits and through uh, traditional or, or contemporary art shows that we do once a year. So uh, we're both interested in telling the, the history, but also in acknowledging that we're here in the present. You've also been involved in a number of film projects. Could you tell us about the Iroquois creation story? Sure. Uh, the Iroquois creation story, there are many versions. I chose a version that was done by or recited by a man named John Arthur Gibson, who was a Seneca chief. He lived at the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario. And he related this story about in the year about 1901. And uh, basically he was he was telling a, an age old story of how the world came to be as it is and, and how two twins went about creating this world that we experience. And I decided I wanted to create a visual uh, record of that or a story in, in film. And so in order to do that, I obtained a grant and I worked with our traditional singers and dancers, some of our speakers. I worked with a dance group called Garth Fagan Dance, who is very famous for his work with the Lion King. And then also worked with the Rochester Institute of Technology to uh, work with uh, animators who helped to create the story in, in film. You've used a paper bag many times in your work. What does that mean to you? Well, uh, several years ago, you know, a long time back now, um, I realized that the paper bag, although it was a very common object, was also something that was a kind of a universal, that everyone used paper bags here in the United States, and that they were kind of, a, in a way, unifying us uh, by, by the fact that they, they existed. And most times, people just threw them away after one-time use. And uh, I decided to, you know, kind of personalize them and uh, influenced by my Seneca beadwork and, and by other parfleche containers and various other decorated bags, I added some, you know, native uh, influence to the paper bag using a variety of different media and, and making it a more personal and a timely statement about events that were going on in my life at a given time. And for whatever reason, the critics really responded to the bags and they have sort of become something I'm known for and in a way opened the door to my art, uh, to other, to places like the Museum of Modern Art or the Whitney Museum in New York City, uh, the Heard Museum in Phoenix. That was Seneca artist Peter Jemison. Leonard Peltier has served more than 46 years in a federal maximum security prison for the deaths of two FBI agents in the 1970s. In recent years, there have been renewed calls for his clemency, an action that can be done by President Joe Biden. Ruth Buffalo had the very rare chance of visiting with Peltier. Alia Chavez asked her about the trip. Um, it was a, a really good trip. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I, I'm really thankful that I had uh, three days to visit with our relative and elder, um, Native elder Leonard Peltier. How did a trip like this happen? Had you been communicating with him beforehand? Yeah, um, I believe about a year ago, we started communicating through phone conversations. Um, and then um, he sent a letter on my birthday and had an application in there to apply to become uh, to, to get on his visitors list. Um, but that was during the uh, campaign season. And so I wasn't able to uh, fill out the forms and everything until end of November. And when you actually saw him, um, what stood out to you most in those kinds of conversations? Uh, without getting too emotional, because it, it really uh, tugs at the heartstrings for me, and I think for a lot of people, but just seeing a very, um, very elderly man who looked like a relative of, of many of ours, uh, but just seeing him in there, um, in that setting to begin with was really hard to... Um, hard not to get overwhelmed or uh, overcome with a lot of uh, emotions just, you know, from the the time you go in, you know, they you wait in different areas um, and 
being in there with other uh, individuals who are, are going to, to visit their, their loved ones was really, um, it just was a lot of uh, powerful emotions. Um, we had heard um, for several years now that the state of his health is something that a lot of supporters had been concerned about. And you just mentioned that he um, was very elderly appearing. Um, what could you kind of say about how he was doing uh, physically? Um, again, he's, you know, he's 78 years old. Um, he has a number of health, serious health conditions. Um, and so he... Um, yeah, I, I just, I kind of hesitate on how much to share and, and what to share, what not to share. But, um, you know, when we were parting ways, he did uh, lose his balance a couple times. Um, and so he is, his spirit is, you know, strong in my eyes, you know, but he is very um, frustrated with um, with still being in there. And so he needs to, to come back to North Dakota, here in North Dakota, and be with his loved ones, his relatives. Um, but yeah, he, he does have some serious health conditions that need attention. Um, he is now um, has a cell mate, which he has shared uh, very deep concerns over. Um, they do go in lockdown randomly, and he just came off of a five-day lockdown recently. Um, and so the, they go into lockdown without um, notice and they're confined to their their small cells um, and now he is sharing his cell very small cell with the cellmate. Ruth I, I read an interview that you did recently and you said that there was parts of your conversations that you wanted to keep private and I want to respect that but I think that this is the perfect avenue for native people listening to this conversation to kind of learn more so I'd like to ask you again what you do feel comfortable sharing in terms of conversation topics. Yes, um, during those three days, we, you know, I was there for New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, and January 2nd, um, and so we talked a lot, you know, it was just kind of visiting back and forth um, as, as relatives, you know, talking about stories growing up in North Dakota, um, you know, his time spent in Wapaton Indian Boarding School, which is an hour south of here in Fargo, um, a lot of similarities and a lot of overlaps and a lot of a common theme of justice and, and standing up for justice and continuing to push for justice, um, not just for natives, but also for all people. Um, and so it's very important that we continue to push for his release. Um, he still stands by his innocence. And, you know, I stand by our relative native elder Leonard Peltier. He needs to be free. More needs to be done in looking at his case. Um, we, we know this has been going on for decades. This as in injustice, this as in bias within the criminal justice system. Um, he had mentioned also, so I just learned so much from him. Um, he has so much knowledge and, you know, he, he shared um, also that as Native people, we are the only group of people that is not afforded a jury of peers. Um, so a lot of what he is going through, many of our relatives face in every level of government, whether it's a state prison, county jail, uh, federal prison, and, and we know that we are overrepresented in every level of government in the criminal justice system. Um, so lots to unpack there, but so much more work that needs to be done so that our relatives can live a good life like everyone else. That was Ruth Buffalo. When we come back, a historical novel examines Muskogee Creek murders and the oil boom. Stay with us. A new novel focuses on true events for Muskogee Creek citizens in the Tulsa area in the 1920s. J.D. Colbert wrote Between Two Fires, The Creek Murders, and the Birth of the Oil Capital of the World. Earlier this week, I asked him if the story was similar to Killers of the Flower Moon. It's very similar in many ways to Killers of the Flower Moon. My book, of course, it documents, it's a historical fiction thriller, and it is predicated on documented history of the murders of Muscogee Creek natives and the theft of their oil-rich allotments. 
So these events set up a long string of events to end tribal sovereignty, like land allotments and the guardianship system. How do you tell these stories within the novel? While the story focuses, my book focuses on the Muscogee Creek experience, in many ways it's a pan-native experience with regard to such issues as the forced assimilation, the forced allotment of heretofore community-owned tribal lands, the Indian boarding school experience, and the discovery of oil and other valuable minerals, and the subsequent murders of Native peoples. And how did you go about finding the characters within the book? The, most of the books, the characters in my book are historical, most prominently including the two protagonists, the male protagonist, Sam Davis, who was a half-breed Muscogee Creek, and the female protagonist, Zit Kala, who is famous today across Indian country for her expose written in 1924 on behalf of the Indian Rights Association called Oklahoma's Poor Rich Indians, where she documents what was going on at that time, the murders, the theft of the oil-rich allotments, and the legalized threat theft of Native lands through the guardianship system. And how does such, um, how does the discovery of such rich minerals um, impact the Oklahoma tribes today? It's still very much part and parcel of our everyday lives here in Oklahoma. The many people, many families that I know, in fact, most Native families that I know and have grown up with have similar stories to mine of the loss of our native lands by be either by murder or by the the Indian guardianship system. So I sense that there's still this historical trauma that we live with here in Indian country in the eastern the former Indian territory of Oklahoma. And at, at base, what I endeavored to do was to bring this history to light to pull it out from under the rug, from out of the closet, so that there, we might engender greater public awareness of what happened here in this place. What do you want readers to um, understand or take away from the novel? I would like uh, the Native readers to feel a sense of solidarity, of this kind of pan-Native experience. And for the non-Native reader, I would hope, again, that they have a greater awareness of what happened. There are many people I know here in the Tulsa who call themselves fifth or sixth generation Tulsans, but even they don't know about this story. Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland visited Phoenix last week as part of her Road to Healing tour. She listened to boarding school survivors and their descendants share their stories. ICT's Pacey Smith-Garcia has more. The Gila Crossing Community School is filled with boarding school survivors and their descendants. They shared stories, and the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, was there to listen. With her were several government officials, including Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs and Gila River Governor Stephen Rowe Lewis. Holland highlighted her own family's shared trauma from the boarding school system. My ancestors, many of yours, endured the horrors of the Indian boarding school assimilation policies carried out by the same department that I now lead. This is the first time in history that a United States Cabinet Secretary comes to the table with this shared trauma. That is not lost on me, and I'm determined to use my position for the good of the people. Many spoke of the horrors of the system where members of their families were in the schools for an entire generation. The abuse they suffered during their time at Escuela continues to impact our familia in ways I'm still peeling back and processing. When my younger grandmother's dementia began to worsen, she told the same stories. One of those stories that I can recite was about how they split her tongue for speaking up. As many stories as there were told, there are still many more that are untold. You know, there's more stories than this. You only hear so much because there's a lot of 
things that happened that people have kept hidden inside that it's not shared. When asked, some had never spoken of the boarding schools to their descendants before they gave their testimony. No, I haven't. Uh, my own, my, uh, my own story with that is that in a time of religion and living with and among other people, not my tribe, I, uh, in time it did uh, break up my family, my children from me. I didn't have a place any, you know, secure anywhere to go, but um, my family was broken up. After an hour of testimony, the event was closed to the press to allow those giving testimony to feel more comfortable. This is just the first step in healing and correcting the system that has impacted many across Turtle Island. In Phoenix, Arizona, Pacey Smith Garcia, ICT News. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.